Today's guest is Ryan Inman, who teaches people to use their money to live the life of their dreams and provides financial planning for physicians. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. While you're there, you can sign up for a monthly email where I share the best articles I read this month, let you know about upcoming episodes, and share a little wisdom. You can also listen to coaching calls under the coaching calls tab. I also share the most interesting articles I read every week on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richer soul. And there's also a Facebook group where you can ask questions, inter interact with other listeners. Don't forget, we have a new Facebook group for richer soul. I'd be honored to have you join us so we can continue the conversation. Today's focus for the opening is around relationships. I met Ryan and connected because of a group that I'm involved with. I attend a conference regularly, not to sell stuff, but to meet people who are in my space. I just got back from Podcast Movement. I was able to meet listeners who came to the Choose FI and Stacking Benjamins meetup before the event. I also met new people at the conference, and I'm reaching out to those who I think will be exciting guests for the show. I also connected in person with a few past guests and continued to build the relationship. There was a meetup of all of us who are part of FinCon as well, so another great connection point. Overall, it was an exciting few days, and I was able to continue building friendships and work on improving the show. I just joined a mastermind group as well. We're all working together to help each other build the life of our dreams and lead our families. These relationships can help us to move forward and give us a big boost. I'm looking forward to the weekly calls, the accountability, and digging in deeper. I'm really excited to have Ryan on the show today as we talk about being intentional with money in our lives. Ryan deals with physicians who have to deal with delayed gratification as they go through years of school and a residency program, along with the high cost of their education. When they graduate and begin practice medicine, they are met with the expectations of a physician lifestyle. Unfortunately, the days of Wednesday golf at the country club are gone. It's a rarity for them. Let's meet Ryan. Welcome to Richer Soul, Ryan. It's great to have you join us today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Honor is all mine. So let's start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So I would say school probably taught me nothing about money, which is quite sad when you really think back on it. Maybe one class had some money tools or techniques or something inside there. But really, the massive amount of education I received while growing up was huge with my family. I was actually the first one to graduate college or grad school in both sides of my family. But I come from a pretty successful family of entrepreneurs. So there's even pictures of me in a little carrier sitting in the boardroom while my parents are trying to build a 150,000 square foot office building. 
money has always been topics going back and forth. It was definitely not taboo to talk about. It was weird if we weren't talking about it probably close to every day. I mean, just from a young age, I know my mom always was doing little tips and tricks and little things like that. Even when I was like three, four, five years old, trying to get me to be familiar with money, how it worked, why we work for it, how we need to work hard for it. It's just been ingrained since day one. That's an unusual path growing up because most people don't have money as a daily conversation. What were some of those things that they were doing? Could you provide an example? Yeah, it's little things kind of going back. They never wanted me to really work while in school unless I was working for them. But it was you study hard and you get good grades and you should be paid for your time. They viewed school as a job for me, which I think looking back on that is a really interesting thought process. So it was do your best. And I don't remember the exact numbers, Rocky, honestly, but it was, you know, if you get an A, you get five bucks and you get a B, you get a dollar. You get a C, you owe me five dollars. If I got a D or an F, like I'd, I'd be terrified to know what it was <laughs> and how it worked out. But and this is like first grade. They're doing this. And it's just fascinating looking back. And then I have a three and a two year old right now. And I'm trying to instill some of these money principles. And it's just hilarious. Literally today, walking down the hall, my son goes, Daddy, come to my shop. I said, you're what? He my shop. And I said, okay. And I'm looking and he's got all his sisters, basically dolls and toys and things. And I said, well, what's for sale? And he goes, everything here is, and he counts up to 10, says $10. I said, everything is $10? So I, I give you $10, I get everything? He goes, no, each. Give me your money, please. <laughs> you know, and he's, three, he's like three turning four. So, I mean, I'm trying to instill these things in my kids as well. But it just was an, an interesting thought process to be paid for, for grades, even though it wasn't that much. But it was at a very young age. So out of curiosity, what did you do for your college and grad school? What were your degrees in? So you could probably tell, like, I grew up as a money nerd, <laughs> always talking about money. So my undergrad was in accounting, and then I have an MBA and also a master's in accounting and financial management. So I did two graduate degrees. Clearly, I liked school. Clearly, you like school. So in any of that schooling, did they teach you about money and, and how to utilize it to build the life you want? Yeah. So the accounting side, not so much. And we might be talking about this, but learning about balance sheets and income statements and things like that. And I kind of adopted that into like running my own life as a mini business, if you will. But it's fascinating that during the graduate programs, they teach you how to look at money, manage money, basically everything you could almost put into a calculator, right? But what they didn't teach was how to talk about it. And if you hadn't come from a background where it was known to talk about it and the way to do it. I mean, we're talking things like your ideal life. What is interesting? What makes you passionate about getting up and doing work? Working because you want to, not because you have to. Those kind of things never taught. And I kind of look at that as life planning as much as financial planning. So that stuff isn't taught, but all the, the book smart stuff is obviously taught in, in those graduate programs. I found very much the same thing. And even then, when they talk about money, they talk about it from a business standpoint, not from your personal viewpoint of running your life like a business. That mm -hmm. connection never seems to come across. So out of curiosity, your family didn't go to college. And while they seemed interested in supporting you through high school, was there just not the conversation that you decided to go out on your own at 18 and that you decided to continue to college? What was that all about? Yeah, I think it's maybe because I'm a little stubborn and don't like to take the easy path. So the easy path would have been start working for mom and dad and, and go to business. Now, they're, they were both developers of real estate, millions of square feet in Las Vegas here. And it's something that I enjoy. I love real estate, obviously have a huge background in it, but it didn't excite me as much as the concept of financial planning, helping others achieve what they really want. So when I went to school, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew that I wanted to do something with the markets. And as an advisor, knowing what I know now, I laugh at how this eventually got started. I was the 15-year-old kid that was asking mom to set up a TD Ameritrade account because I wasn't old enough to trade on my own to allow me to put the money that I've earned into this account and start trading at a young age where most kids are out trying to figure out how to spend it, I was figuring out how to quadruple it. 
in all the wrong ways, by the way. I mean, penny stocks, trying to buy active researching balance sheets and income statements and forward earnings of companies and then going like, how could I find the right stock? Horrible idea now looking back with all the research that shows, you know, active investments just aren't going to exceed passive. I mean, Nobel Prize winning research, right? But at the time, I had no idea. I was 15, just having fun. But that really piqued my interest. And so when I got to college, I said, this is what I want to do. How do I do it? I even worked for Merrill Lynch for a little bit during the grad school. That was a real rude awakening. That was probably one of the longest years of my life, if I look back at it. Super cutthroat environment. It was one of these where it's 95% sales, 5% actual work. And the actual work was, well, let's put you into these funds. And they come from New York. New York tells you, you know, here's all the funds you can basically put your clients into. And it's not that many. Most of them are Merrill funds or funds that they get kickbacks from and not really amazing investments for people. And then that only ended up being 5% of your work. So it was pretty eye-opening and terrible experience. I was happy to find that there is a whole nother side of financial planning which is the fee-only financial planning. I, I look at it as like the true financial planning. And you couple that with life planning, which I know you talk a lot about finding your why and making sure that you're happy and you can work on your own terms, not because you have to, that kind of stuff. I'm so fortunate that I found that. And that's why I started my firm about three years ago doing that type of planning. That's awesome. And unfortunately, I think this is kind of a new area of bringing life planning and financial planning together. And there aren't very many firms that bring that intersection together. And it doesn't surprise me about what your experiences were like. Actually, I didn't realize it was that bad at some of these places. But I think people need to realize that a lot of these places where you think you're going to get money advice are not at all places for money advice. They are in the sales business and... They make money regardless of whether you make money or lose money. They're just trying to keep you as a customer, and they want you, in some senses, to feel insecure, because if you're smart about your money, you'll realize that they're not going to help you. Yeah, it's the black box they're selling. And I love being alive at this point in time with technology coming out and the internet exposing all of this crap, because they won't be able to sell the black box anymore. Just go to Bogleheads. You'll read all about investments so you know as much as probably the advisor are talking to. But a lot of these big firms, it's let's sell insurance. How many different types of products can we sell them? Like, look, if your financial advisor or anyone you're talking to sells you a product, just turn around, run. The person giving you advice should be giving you conflict-free advice. It shouldn't be, oh, you need this, this, and this. And by the way, buy this, this, and this. That's just a terrible business. But that's how these big Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Northwestern Mutual, these big companies, that's all they do. Bring them in. You're a number. The Northwestern Mutual guy probably has four or 500 quote unquote clients that he provides planning for, which entails selling them term, converting to whole life so they can make more money, pulling assets under management so they can charge you a percentage of that. And, oh, you need some financial planning. Eh, this is kind of the ballpark, but that's generally how the planning goes. And it's honestly a very frustrating thing coming out of our training, if you will, and going through school and grad school and all that to be exposed to that. But something said about their marketing engines and their sales techniques, because clearly it works. It does. And I've always had an interest in that and I've always wanted to do that, but I've always had a dilemma. And my dilemma was I'm not going to sell those products because I don't believe in them. And especially for the insurance products that are very high commission. That mm -hmm. means that the returns are horrible and you have to go sell all your friends stuff. And I was like, I couldn't live with myself if I had to sell my friends crap. So I said, no, and I feel bad. <laughs> what do you mean? You don't want to sell a $5 million variable, some type of whole life policy and receive 30000 in commission? You don't think that that's a conflict of interest at all? Clearly, it's a conflict of interest, but the problem Clearly. is you're locking somebody into a product that they literally can't get out of without taking massive, massive losses, and some of those products implode, and you don't even get, so to speak, the benefit of them, and I couldn't do that. Let's just say the products work. I don't think they do, but let's just say they work, and this is the hard part because it's not disclosed. 
when you go buy a policy, that agent is going to make anywhere from 80 to 120% of your first year's premium. So you bought even disability. So, I mean, you know that I work with all physicians and disability is like one of the most important things that they need, but I won't sell it to them because I want this real no conflict of interest barrier here. I want that to be a concrete wall that they know that I'm not pitching them stuff, but they still need it. But if you go to them and it's like they need to sell a disability and something that they need, disability, 80 to 120% of the first year's premium, that could be three, four or 5,000 bucks. And then it's a trail of three to 10%, depending on what it is. Whole life and all this other stuff is significantly worse, but I don't think that's a massive conflict of interest. Even if you have a great advisor, that they're going to be compensated above and beyond what you're doing in terms of financial planning to sell you this product. It's ludicrous. And a lot of these big investment banks and quote unquote planning firms, that's their main thing. Oh, planning is free or planning is only $2,000 a year, but we're going to sell you so many products and charge you so much money that you're never even going to know. It's disgusting. And I had no idea about that going through school. And then it was really eye opening the first couple of years of my career. I'm just so thankful I found out that there's a better form of planning and and you mentioned most advisors aren't doing life planning. And it's because it's still relatively new because they don't train this. Like there's nothing in the CFP materials. There's nothing in any of the graduate materials about this. George Kinder is considered the godfather of life planning, if you will, at the Kinder Institute. And he's got developed some training for advisors to help walk through the concepts of what is really important to you. How does your ideal life shape? And if you're married... You and your spouse have some really similar stuff, right? Hopefully you're married, but you're also two separate people. So what are your dreams? What are his dreams? And how can you achieve those things without pushing one over the other in a way that allows you to be responsible and kind of adult by saving for retirement and all that good stuff while still living the life that you want today and being responsible and enjoying life. And it's not taught anywhere. But this is starting, it's kind of like a little movement inside of the financial planning industry, if you will, the real financial planning industry. And it's fascinating to see. It is. Before we dig into that, I want to step back to disability, because I think this is an area that everyone should have disability insurance, simply from the standpoint of if you have life insurance and you drop dead, you don't need to worry about anything anymore, because essentially you're dead, right? Everyone else has to worry. and you have kids or young kids or a family, you want to protect them, but you personally have nothing to worry about at that point. Even if you don't have medical insurance and you have a heart attack, they're going to treat you at the hospital, right? You're still going Mm -hmm. to get care. If you become disabled, and the rates of disability are kind of high, if you become disabled, you now have no income and you're still living life. And that's got to be a pretty unhappy state to be in. And to try and get Social Security to pay out is a long and slow process. And they are very good at not paying. I just let people know that having good disability is important for them for the long term. Now, you said a lot of these people have very high commission rates. Is there a place you can buy disability insurance at let's call it a discount or commission free? So disability is one of these things that you need to go to someone who really specializes in your circumstance. So I work with a lot of physicians and I know that there are a couple places that they can go to find some real high quality advice. Let's say they're not working with me, find some high quality advice on what type of insurance they need. There's also some places for, let's say non-physicians, whether it's attorneys, architects, whatever, that you can go to some online stuff like Policy Genius is got it where you can walk through kind of almost think of it as like a robo advisor for insurance. You're not going to get the best advice or the best coverage because you're really doing it yourself, but you're going to be able to get it at a fair price. I tend to use someone, his name is Larry Keller with Physician Financial Services, and he is just amazing at what he does. I know that I can trust him to help out my clients. I send to them. I tell people on the financial residency podcast, go hang out, talk to them because you're going to get some real high quality advice with respects to disability and how important it is. It's one of these things when you look at term versus disability term, you're never going to see the benefit, right? 
in order for it to pay out, you're going to pass. It's meant for spouse, kids, grandkids, whatever it is. Disability, you will see the benefit and you hope to never see it. But I think the study just came out. It was like one in every four people are going to experience a period of disability by the time they hit age 65. So this isn't a scare tactic. That's just the numbers. So if you believe you're one of the three of the four, have at it. And some people can't qualify for disability coverage, and that's okay, but it's good to find out if you don't. But if we're looking at disability, essentially, this is the coverage that you're going to have. If you were to go disabled for more than 90 days, your work hopefully will have some type of coverage. Usually there's some group benefits that you can piggyback on by just working at a place. If you're self-employed, you'd have to get your own. But if you're working at a corporate job, usually they'll have anywhere between 50 and 70% of your base compensation. Base is a key word. If you're paid base and then you have a bunch of bonuses and on stuff on top of that, none of that's usually covered in a group policy. And then that's usually you will have to take tax out of that. So if they cover 50%, you're still going to end up paying tax on that because it's paid with pre-tax dollars. Can't you pay it post-tax dollars and then you don't have to pay tax on it? Some employers allow you, some don't. And then any of the policies that you're going to get outside through another agent, which by the way, please go to an independent agent if you're going to look at doing this. Don't go to someone that works for just one company. Even if the company is great, like I only sell principal. Okay, we need to sell something different. We need to be able to compare and contrast, see what plans. I mean, there's tons of writers. We shouldn't go down that rabbit hole, but... Lots of writers that you might want to look at. You just need to be able to compare multiple ones. So Policy Genius would probably be a good place to start. If you're looking for term insurance, there's something called Term for Less that you can go and at least compare. And then I'd reach out to an agent. I wouldn't go to your local state farm to find it. I'd be going to an independent broker that can compare and contrast several companies at once. You never know, because some are much less than others, but you need to understand what the coverage is, because one might Mm -hmm. be cheaper, but the coverage may not be as good. So you need to make sure that you've got that right. So -hmm. getting back to the life planning thing, and this is the thing that excited me, and what I do is to kind of, you know, merge money and life, money being the tool that you use to live the life you choose to live. I think one of the reasons it wasn't done in the past is that Essentially, financial planners are not paid to do it, especially the traditional path of where it's assets under management. The bottom line is you're not paid to do it. And the other problem is when offered the choice, people aren't always willing to pay to do it. And that's probably the biggest mistake because you go through life without that plan and then you're in the drift and you don't get to achieve what you could have achieved. Yeah, that's completely true. I mean, there's a big problem right now with the way that financial planners or financial advisors are compensated. From the beginning, we are trained. You need to charge AUM. It's the only way to work with people. And you actually need to have minimums. Otherwise, you're working with someone who's got, maybe it's their first investment account just out of college, who actually needs planning help and trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life. But they don't have enough money. Ah, What are you going to do? I mean, Charge, you know, $20,000 is how much they have to invest, and 1% on that is $200 a year. There's no way you're going to service that person. And that's why the entire industry is around AUM with minimums. Some people charge to do an actual financial plan where they'll intake all the documents and all these things, and oh, they'll ask you some superficial, like, what are your goals? What do you plan to do? And then they give you some 50 page document that you're never going to read. And you're going to go through and probably just put it in the drawer there and collecting dust. It's silly how, honestly, thinking back, it's pretty ridiculous how that is the industry norm or model. And we're starting to see advisors come out and charge a monthly fee where it's not a big three five thousand $5,000 fee and a percentage of assets. It's a monthly fee to work with this person. And that is a way to start getting some of this life planning involved. You're not actually paying for the life plan, but it's part of the planning process, if you will. And I agree with that. I think the life plan is the more important part, because what I find is, especially on a lot of these groups I'm in or on all these chat boards, everyone is asking these questions. Should I invest in a Roth IRA? How much house should I buy? 
Should I pay down debt or should I invest first? And the problem is, is you're asking someone else their advice that may work for them, but may not work for you. And if you don't know what your goals are and what you want out of your life, the answers to the questions are all wrong. If you can't lay out and say, this is who I am, this is what I want, this is where I'm going, this is how I'm getting there, then you can ask the money question, because then we can get you great money answers. But most people don't do that. That, I think, is the biggest struggle right there. So you're telling me that personal finance is actually personal? <laughs> what? It is? Of course. Of course. And the, the thing is, is, here's the deal. You could be a, the DIY type person. You could go study, read up, look at all these things, t- lots of great blogs, lots of great books out there, and you can do this yourself. Most people don't want to take the time, don't have the time, maybe, or just generally don't like what they're doing. And so they'll start crowdsourcing some of this. And the problem is they're crowdsourcing to like-minded individuals, probably someone in their same profession or friends that are not planners, that have no background. Maybe they're lucky and have someone who's super into it that just loves personal finance. But most of the time they're getting bad advice from people who shouldn't be giving advice in the first place. So you've got that uphill battle. And then to not understand or even write down or commit to thinking on it of what do I really want? What is this money used for? That's the most fascinating question. What do you plan on using your money for? Why are we saving in an IRA or a 401k to retire? Well, what does retirement look like? I have clients that tell me I want to be done with medicine in 10 years. Okay. That's interesting. That's very personal. That's very unique. This person 34 and want to be done in, by 44. It's very aggressive. Hopefully they've got the income to do that, but you start there. I have other ones that tell me, I'll be, you'll be wheeling me around and I'll be rounding on patients at 80. I just love what I do. Those are two very unique, right? And I gave you extremes because I have those extremes with people I'm working with. But if you don't know what that is, then how could someone on a message board or on a Facebook group actually give you the right advice if you don't even know what that looks like? And if you don't know what that money is going to be used for and then back it in, how risky are you, right? I'm incredibly aggressive. I know that my money is going to be used, I think, ultra long term. Some people look at it in their investments. They see the market today, that short term that they look at today and go, oh my gosh, we're down a percent. I need to sell something. You got to look at how much risk can you take and how much risk should you take? Two very different questions that no one else can answer unless they know all the details or you know all the details. So it's not to say that you have to go work with a planner, but you have to know what you want. So start there. What does my life look like? Is it the quote unquote American dream to own the house and do all these fancy things? Or are you a minimalist that is like, I'll live in a, one of these tiny homes and travel the world and do this. I mean, it's different for everyone. So start there. What is the money used for? And then start working backwards. Well, how much money do I need to get to where I want to go? And Rocky, I know we talked about the safe 4% withdrawal rate. Like there's some very back of the napkin concepts you can do to just get close to where you want to go and just start working backwards. How much money do I need to make? How much of that do I need to save? It's not about how much your investments make. I mean, that's great. That's what gets the headlines, but it's how much you're saving and what are you doing with the money that you are saving? And so before we dig into that, I kind of almost want to take a step back and examine those two extreme people. Because on the one side, you've got a guy who wants to be retired at 44, and he probably got out of medical school in his fellowship maybe five, six years ago, which means prior to that, he spent 10, 15 years going through a very intense schooling that he didn't have a life to live. What does he want to do at 44? Does he know? I'll give you kind of a general thing. With this concept, they were looking at transitioning from something of what they're doing to something in like public health. And it was more of, I'm really burnt out. Okay. I've gone through a ton of school, a ton of training. I work seven days a week. 
in and out of the OR. This is crazy. And I don't even know what my 20s look like for this specific thing. Doctors have it quite rough when you look at how much they go through and sacrifice to get there. But it wasn't, I'm going to retire at 44, kick my feet up and eat Cheetos. And And that was kind of my question. (laughs) Yeah. And the guy who wants to work till 80, I think that's awesome. I still think you need financial freedom because... You might be 52 and working in a toxic environment and want to be able to walk away. If you have financial freedom, then you can walk away and go find a nicer environment to work with and not be stuck. And so regardless of which of these situations you are, you still need to understand the dollars below them. So you talked about the 4% withdrawal rate, and that kind of talks about a safe withdrawal rate that if you have X amount of money, how much you'll be able to take out every year. So essentially, it basically says, if you have a million dollars in investable assets, you can safely withdraw $40,000 a year, inflation adjusted. And again, these are US-based results, because it's my understanding these studies do not hold up for international. The 4% rule is mostly a US-based paradigm. So a million dollars gives you 40 grand a year in spending, essentially, is what it comes down to. And you can actually go backwards the other way and look at your spending per year and multiply it by 25, and that will give you the result. Actually, I just did it with a small thing the other day in my mind, because I'm like, we have all these bills. The cell phone bill is 150 bucks a month. The cable bill is 150 bucks a month. If I have a $150 a month bill, and I multiply that by 12 months, that's $1,800 a year. In order to support that $1,800 a year in spending, I need to multiply that by 25, which means I need to save $45,000 so I can pay my cell phone bill. I need to save another $45,000 to pay my cable bill. At this point, we got almost 100 grand saved, and all I'm paying for is entertainment. I mean, we haven't even talked about eating out, food, A house, I think when you start to realize how much you need and assets to do the things you want to do, you might start to question where you're spending your money. Because I think lifestyle creep, and I know especially for physicians, oh, you're a physician, you're expected to live a certain lifestyle. It becomes very difficult. And I think that's true for other professions as well. Mm -hmm. Hold on real quick. I'm canceling my cable bill. (laughs) I mean, in all seriousness, actually, I don't subscribe to TV, but I need internet, obviously, for work and just entertainment in itself. But I mean, yeah, it is eye-opening when you go the other way. And it's actually funny. You never think of it that way. We just lump expenses together and say, oh, I spend a hundred grand a year. You're going to need two and a half million dollars in retirement to be able to do this or whatever the number is. It's not, oh, my cell phone bill is this amount. This equates to X amount of dollars I need to have saved before I retire. And hopefully that puts it into perspective for people to say, everything you're spending, you better really enjoy what you're doing. And it better bring true happiness. Now, some of this stuff can't be perfect, right? Insurance, that does not bring me true happiness, but that brings me peace of mind. Knowing that if something happened, the loved ones that I have are going to be covered. Or disability, if I have disability coverage, like I know that if something happens to me, we're not going to be eating ramen and out on the street, right? We're going to have some... Income, to, But it's the rest of the stuff, the stuff that you're spending, it needs to provide true happiness and improve the quality of your life and make you overall happier. Otherwise, it needs to be cut. And when you can figure that stuff out, the stuff that becomes a yes, yes, this brings me happiness. Then it's super easy to say, no, that doesn't bring me as much happiness, right? The way I look at it is every dollar you make, doesn't matter if you make 40000 a year or 400000 a year, every dollar you make has a job. The first job, unless you like going to jail, you're going to pay your taxes, right? That's probably a priority. Then you're going to look at it and go, okay, now I've paid taxes. Now the next piece, well, I kind of value having a place to live. So I'm going to to do this. And it's not the biggest, most expensive home that you can possibly afford because that's what society tells you. Look at it as what would make you happiest? What kind of home? Is it the big home that all your family can come to and does stretch your budget a little bit to do that, go ahead and do it. But you're giving up something else. Something else is turning into a no for doing that. And go on down. You need transportation. Do you need a Tesla Model X that goes zero to 60 in two seconds? If yes, 
okay, what are you giving up for it? And if not, and it's a car is just a way to get from A to B, what can you do in a safe, reliable manner that would be able to allow you to say yes to something that would really make you happy? That's the way I look at all of this planning is just going one by one and saying, does this make you happy? And if not, how can we change it? So you can start doing some of the stuff that makes you happy. And I totally agree with that. You do have to make the choices and you have to make trade-offs. And I think too often people don't make the trade-offs and that's the problem. People don't make the choices. They look at each choice individually, but not as balanced against something else. And that's what you really have to do is balance your choices. It's either this or that, not this or not this. And I think that little mind shift can dramatically help you make choices and do them without regrets and without guilt and so forth. Absolutely. And it's one of these things. So like I was talking with a client last week and we were going over saving for their retirement and the concept of saving for their kids in a 529. And looking at it, I was like, guys, we have a little bit of trouble here trying to get all of this taken care of. So how important is it to save for your kid's college? And they said, look, we don't want to be where we're at, where we were at now with debt and all these things. We don't want our kids there. So we really want to save for it. I said, perfect. This is important to you, right? And they go, very, very important. I said, okay, let's look at the variable expenses that you guys currently have. Is there anything that is less important than saving for your kids? And we went down the list and it was like, it wasn't just cut dining out, right? But let's say they're dining out. I'm just going to throw a number out. It was $1,000 a month. Can you guys go out for $500 a month? and enjoy going out, dining out, making these things special, and knowing that the other 500 is actually going to your kid's education. And they were like, done. That's perfect. We didn't cut it out completely, but we were able to reduce it. They can still enjoy it. It's not they didn't go cold turkey, never eating out groceries only. But knowing that when they do go out, it's special. And when they don't go out, they know that they're saving for their kid's education. And that was important to them. That was their, yes, this makes me happier. And you're able to do it. So it doesn't mean that you need to cut everything out and never go out and be just a hermit. Just do stuff with purpose. Be intentional. And along those same lines, I think, is we've had quite a few conversations around college is why are you going to college? What's the purpose? And is there a cheaper way to get that degree? Mm -hmm. I just want to go party. (laughs) That's what every kid wants to tell their parents, yes. but can't. So they go, oh, to get a degree, of course, to, get, a to degree. get a job I want. But if you think about it, if you're going to spend $200,000 to go party, no offense, there are better parties than college. You should really go party. Mm. It's a conversation for another day. <laughs> yeah, I think college is going to be very different coming up for the next generation. I don't think it's sustainable at growing at 6 or 7% above inflation. And I looked at it just for my son and daughter and- they're three and two right now, and their college education going to a private school. And I used University of San Diego because that's where I went, and my wife went, it's where we actually met when we were 18. And it was going to be close to $600,000 for a four year degree. I'm like, there's no way that this pencils, unless they're coming out of school and making four hundred or $500,000 a year for some crappy corporate desk job. There's no way that this works. So I think we're going to see a shift in what the government's actually going to foot the bill for college is probably going to hopefully become cheaper or you're going to see trade schools be utilized a lot more or JUCOs like the junior colleges getting your electives and that kind of stuff done in their first two years and then transferring to a a really good school for the next two years to get the education and whatever you're trying to do. Honestly, for me, I just look at this and go, if that's what you want to do in the sense, why not just get 10 professors and have them record accounting 101, each one with a slight flavor. And the kid just goes and he watches the videos and you show up at some testing place and you take the test. I would love to see it. I know MIT is already doing most, if not all their stuff is already recorded. It is, but you don't get the degree. You need the piece of paper. (laughs) Yeah. Well, there's one that like for the, for high school, right? There's the GED, like you can go take it and show that you passed because that's always looked kind of negatively upon, but maybe there's somewhere that that kind of pops up that it's like a proficiency I am proficient in this, and this would have caused me to pass whatever training this was. It wasn't ABCD or grades. It was I am proficient. 
there are ways to do that. That's a whole episode in and of itself. Of course. So if people want to start tracking their money, do you have some money tools that you recommend for them? I use some personal financial software because I'm an advisor and it's not economical for someone to use it. But the closest that I've actually seen is personal capital. Now, be aware that when you log into personal capital and if you have 100,000 of assets, you will get a phone call or several phone calls and they will be quite annoying because they want you to put money with them and it's 50 basis points or whatever it is and they're going to want to manage your money and show you how to do it right. And while that's not a bad thing, it's annoying and just you should probably decline it. But their software is top notch. It allows you to track everything, links everything up. Mint.com is one that allows you to do for budgeting things. But personal capital is mint on steroids, if you will. I really like their stuff. I've poked around, set up some of my things just to be able to give someone a free resource. Love what they're doing. For investments, I can't give like obviously investment related advice, but investments Vanguard, top-notch. Go research the Boggleheads and go look at information on Vanguard and index investing, and that's where you need need to look. There's new apps coming out. One I just am trying because I thought it was a crazy cool concept was M1 Finance. They allow you to trade completely for free. And Iraqi, if you're like me and you're going, well, where do you make your money? How does this work? They actually make it on the spread between when things settle. So when you put money in, it takes three days to settle. They earn interest for the three days. If you're, you know, get a dividend, it's got to settle. It takes a day to do it before it gets redeployed. They make interest that day. When you're buying and selling, you can't buy and sell this in the same day. So however long it takes to settle, then that's where they make their interest. Fascinating concept, but you can buy anything inside there for free, no trading. So those are kind of the couple things that I would look at from trying to Take control of your finances. See everything holistically. I would be using something like personal capital to do that. Have you used Quicken at all? That's what I've used since like the early 90s. And sometimes they're annoying, but I haven't found anything better than that that tracks all of my money, all my spending, and allows me to run reports. Yeah, personal capital is probably right on that same point. I haven't used Quicken in probably that long. (laughs) But I did poke around a number of years back on some of the different ones. But recently, it's been personal capital has been the one. But they're annoying because they come in and they try to solicit you to put money with them. But if you just tell them, I'm I'm not interested. Like, I just tell them, oh, I'm working with a planner. I'm not interested. Then they never called me back. But it was (laughs) good 10 phone calls in two months. I'm like, no, not interested. No, not interested. Okay, I'm working with someone. Thanks. Don't call me again. But their software is great. All right. And have you looked at status money? Status money kind of compares you with other people. No, I haven't. And it allows you to see how you compare to other people. So you put in some information, it links up to your accounts, and then it looks at your income and it compares somebody with your income, your net worth, your spending to other people by categories and so forth. It actually sucks the data out of your credit cards and your bank. That's interesting. So it's kind of like, are you keeping up with the Joneses, but on the reverse side? How are you saving versus your peers? Which I think would be interesting. It also shows how you're spending versus your peers. So Okay. Yeah. I mean, the same way around it. But I think that's interesting. But again, it brings back the personal finances personal. Like, what if some of those people on there were are receiving benefits from somewhere else, grandparents gifting? What if someone lives in... Arkansas versus San Francisco. Oh, they look at all of that. Oh, okay. You can put in your zip code and you can compare yourself to your area. I'll have to check that out. You don't have to compare yourself to someone in Arkansas. (laughs) You actually get to compare yourself to your equal kind of income group. And so that tells you, hey, you're outspending the Joneses. You've got a problem because they have all this money and you're broke. Or, hey, you're underspending the Joneses and you're doing a good job. And because of that, You have a lot more money than your neighbor does, so to speak, because that's literally what it's comparing you to, your peer group. This is like social indifference, but the other way around. I love it. That's super cool. Absolutely. So I always talk about financial statements and running your life like a business. Thoughts Mm -hmm. on that? Well, yeah. I mean, you got to look at it. So you got assets on one end, you got liabilities on the other. 
and you want more assets and less liabilities, right? So debt would be a liability, credit card debt, student debt, house debt, those kind of things. You've got assets on one end. It could be cash in the bank. It could be your house. It could be your investment accounts, whatever it is. Obviously, you want more cash and more assets than your liabilities. And actually, it's funny thinking on this. One of the things I get asked a lot is, okay, I'm now making money. I'm out of school, whatever it is, making money. I've got all these commitments. What do I do? Well, the first thing is we need to take inventory of what you have, right? Easy for you guys out there. Literally draw a T on a big piece of paper. On the left side, put out anything like your cash, your retirement accounts, anything that could be considered an asset. On the right side of the T, put anything that's a liability. Credit card debt, it could be mortgage, could be student debt, probably student debt if you're younger. And then with the liability side, look at it and say, is any of this 8%, 7% or more, right? This is your high interest rate debt. If so, the majority of your money needs to be going to pay that off because to get that type of return in the market right now is doable, but isn't as likely as paying down high interest debt. And I guess the only thing that we, I guess Rocky come into that is making sure you get your employer match before you do that. So if you're committing to your 401k or 403b and your employer matches the first couple percent, you need to do that. That's like 100% on your money. Nothing's going to be better than that. But then paying off all your high interest debt and then looking at maximizing your retirement accounts. So again, building up assets and that kind of thing. And then you invest in things that would give you high expected returns if you're so inclined. This could be real estate, stuff like that. And then looking at paying off moderate debt. So I would say anything in the four to six percent range or four to seven if you're depending on what you want to consider high interest rate debt. And then outside of that, then it's kind of just where else can you put money? Most people can put it in a taxable account or you can look at paying down mortgages as mortgage rates tick up now. We're seeing 30 year fixed rates at four and a half or 4.75 now. So that starts to get into well into the moderate interest rate level that maybe you're starting to pay down your home in addition. But running yourself as a business, it first takes you thinking like a business. How can I increase profits, right? Increase my income. And how can I get rid of things that lower my income or the debt? And you might often hear, well, that's good debt and that's bad debt. I agree. But at the same time, having no debt is ideal. So I'm going to drop links in the show notes to a balance sheet and to cash flow. And I'm even going to throw in some video links so you can learn how to use the sheets. Oh, that's awesome. When it comes to good debt versus bad debt, I think the easiest way to define good debt is good debt generates income, right? So Mm -hmm. if I'm going to invest in a rental home and I'm going to take debt against the rental home. Yes, I'm going into debt, but it's putting money in my pocket, correct? At the end of the day. So that's good debt. Yeah. So if you're looking at a home, say you're going to buy a rental $200,000 piece of property that's in a decent area. Let's say you did all your due diligence and you're going to end up making $300 a month on that house. Now, obviously you've got to have some savings for repairs and maintenance and unexpected vacancy and all that good stuff. But let's say you're making 300 bucks, but you had to take out 150,000 of debt to buy that home. That is actually good debt because that debt is making you money. Your renter is paying thing. Obviously you have to have the risk tolerance and the will. That is not a passive investment, by the way. I don't care what anyone tells you. I own plenty of rentals. They are not passive, but it's a good diversification tool to use. But ultimately I don't want to retire and still have debt on these homes. So even though it's good debt, eventually I want it paid down and then cash flowing the whole rent, not the rent minus the mortgage. Correct. And so for everyone else then, bad debt is anything that costs you money. So that might even include your house in a sense. I love it because I was about to go there. So (laughs) you know you're talking about your primary residence, right? Yes, Yeah. And people think that buying a primary residence is their first and best investment. That's the, like I referenced earlier, the American dream. Unless you own it outright, that is not that great of an investment. Even if you own it outright, it's not. But that costs you money every month. Yes, you need a place to live. 
yes, renting is throwing money away versus buying a home, but there's plenty of expenses that come up owning your own home. It's not truly considered an investment. No. And so I think people should realize that that's not good debt. And college debt is also not necessarily good debt because if you can't afford to pay for college and you're not smart enough to figure out a way, then maybe you should figure out a whole different way to go to college and cut costs. Because if you're going to take that much in debt and you're not getting a degree that's going to pay you a lot, it's not worth it. So that's another example of what may be, and again, it depends on the situation, good debt or bad debt. Yeah, I'd push back just a little bit there and say college debt or just an undergraduate degree, which is obviously needed to go then get more advanced degrees, is probably not great debt. But then if you were to go through an advanced degree that causes you to earn a significantly higher income than others, I could make the argument that it could be considered good debt. So I know I talk about physicians a lot because that's what I deal with all day, every day. But this applies to attorneys and other high income professionals. If you were to take out a loan, let's say for $250,000 to go to medical school and you go through everything and your income to come out of there is $350,000, I could argue to say, hey, you spent or took out debt on a business to buy an income potential of 250 k If you didn't do that, maybe your income capped at 100 k So you took out almost a one-to-one debt-to-income ratio, but that's every year you're going to earn 250 k I could argue that that would be good debt if you viewed it as a business, but at the same time, if you're going to take out $200,000 and go to a top-tier school but come out with a, no offense, but like a philosophy major, yeah, probably not good debt. But even if you go to law school, half of people who go to law school don't even practice law. Well, I mean, that could be a pretty poor decision to go to law school then. Right. And so for advanced degrees, I guess the only ones that I probably agree with are med school. I know in the STEM side, if you go for an advanced degree, especially if you're willing to be a teacher's assistant, you can go to grad school almost for free. MBAs are no guarantee of more money. I don't know what other grad degrees that you pay for can truly provide a return beyond medicine. And there may be some, I'm just not aware. Yeah, I mean, I'm not super familiar with everything on all the different graduate degrees, but even for the ones that you think might not be that great, what if you were in the military and they're going to pay for that? What if you were, like you said, teacher's assistant and they're going to come through and you have a much reduced discount or completely free, all sorts of scholarships and things you can apply for as well. I know plenty of people that have worked for companies like Boeing, right? And then they go and get their MBA at top tier schools and it's 100% free because their company paid for it. There's all sorts of ways to go about it. It's not just, let me just take out debt and go do this. Might take a little more planning involved. So you could still get some of these degrees, but I don't know all the specifics on it. Yeah, I have an MBA and my company paid for it. So it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice 50K savings or whatever it was at the time. Correct. And that's kind of the key is there are different ways to do this, but you have to be intentional. And I think that's kind of the theme that. Mm -hmm. that Yeah, it was premeditated, right? You went through, you were working, and then you went and got your graduate degree and did an MBA. But if you weren't thinking about it and planning for it, like you could have before you start working there. I don't know your exact situation, but you could have. Or someone today could just say, oh, I'm just going to go to MBA school and pay for it versus hey, I know that this company pays for this. And if I have to work there two years in order to get that, the cost savings of not only to actually make money now versus going to school and not making anything, but I can also get it completely paid for. I actually come out hundreds of thousands of dollars ahead, even taking a job that maybe isn't truly ideal in order to get there. You've planned, you were intentional, you thought it through. And hopefully that degree or whatever you're trying to go for will allow you to do something that truly makes you happy then I go do it. So one of the things I think we did kind of gloss over, but didn't really go in detail, and I can't give too many specifics on it, but the concept of you must have someone manage your money and you must pay them the way to do that in form of an assets under management or something like that. There is plenty of material out there that talks about passive investing. I mean, there's Nobel Prize winning research that shows that in terms of length, if you have a true long-term outlook on it that 
active investment will not beat past investment over a long period of time. There's phenomenal books. I think a very basic book for those just beginning to understand or wanting to understand investing is written by another advisor. His name is Alan Roth. And he wrote, I believe it's How a Second Grader Beats Wall Street or some version of that, Rocky. Maybe you can link it in the show notes. Phenomenal book. I tell all the residents, like, read this book. It talks about a three-fund portfolio. It talks about just how Wall Street technically can be against you and what you're trying to do. So I would really encourage, even if you are going to hire someone, understand the basics of investing. Don't let them pull kind of a blanket over you and you not understand anything and just trust someone blindly. As much as I love and care for my clients, no one will care more about your money than you. And that is very true. I know a lot of people don't want to deal with their money. They don't want to think about it. They don't have time. And that's all fine. Mm -hmm. I get it. You can delegate your money for someone else to manage for you, but you still need to take responsibility, understand what's going on, and keep your finger on the pulse. Because otherwise, you will many times be taken to the cleaners, and that's not Mm -hmm. cool. (laughs) Yeah. I always like getting that kind of out there. Even if it's your mom or dad that is an advisor managing money, you should be asking them, why are we investing this way? Well, what does this mean? Why are we doing it this way? It doesn't hurt to ask why. I mean, when we're kids, we ask like hundreds of questions a day. As adults, we ask five. Why are we doing that? Why aren't we asking more questions? So just be mindful and ask more questions when it comes to your money. And that's good advice. So based on our conversation today, what's one action step people can take to move forward this week? I would definitely do that whole concept of a T account. Figure out what all your assets are on the left, all your debt on the right, and start trying to get together a plan, whether it's a debt repayment plan or an investment plan. Take action, be responsible, and if it needs something like Quicken, how you mentioned, or personal capital, to get to be able to see everything, look at everything holistically. Don't silo everything together. Look at it holistically. And then coming back to the life planning really figure out what is your why? What's that ideal life look like? And it seems so vague. There's some information out there. I know, Rocky, you've got plenty of stuff that you've put out on a living life with a purpose and being intentional. But start thinking on that. Write down goals. Like I know very few people who actually write down goals. I've written them down for years. And sometimes I go back and look at them and go, who, who wrote that? Right? <laughs> but write down your goals. And they're going to change. It's okay. And compare and contrast. Have open conversations and open lines of communication with your spouse if you're married. They're just as much to play with this as you are. Look at the new kind of trend of minimalism coming up, right? You can't be a minimalist and your spouse not. That does not work, right? In order to have financial goals and to do what you want, you can't start doing one way and your spouse do another. It doesn't work. So open lines of communication and really start thinking about what you really want out of life and working backwards. Absolutely. And if people would like to find you and connect or listen to your podcast, where can they find you? Oh, of course. So I run a podcast called Financial Residency. It's on all the major things, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, all that, or financialresidency.com. And if you happen to be a physician and looking for some help, my company is Physician Wall Services at physicianwellservices.com and would love to help anyone. So feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for sharing, and thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate you being here. It's an honor. Thank you so much for having me on. As you heard at the beginning, many financial advisors sell you crap you don't need because they make a ton of money, and I never wanted to do that. That's what Richer Soul is all about, making sure you have access to the best financial advice and the ability to make the best choices for you. It's also about merging your life and money together intentionally. You can learn most anything you need by listening to the episodes and even some of the coaching calls. I will do my best to answer your emails. When you get stuck or you have a big life decision and don't want to make a massive mistake or just want another set of eyes on your plans, then it's time to work with me or someone like me, one-on-one. I help people find clarity and take their next steps. You will notice when you visit the website, there are no ads. I don't want to entice you to buy things that you may not need, and I don't sell any products. Speaking of free resources, I link to the videos for figuring out your balance sheet, as Ryan mentioned in his action step. 
You can also track your spending and learn how in the cash flow video. Today's action step was to start figuring out your numbers and also why you want all that money. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with friends and family. I'd appreciate it. And if you have a moment, please leave a review of the podcast. There's a link in the show notes to do so. What's preventing you from moving forward and who are you putting on your team to help build the life you deserve? Taking no action creates a far worse outcome in life than trying something and failing. Can I help you achieve your goals? Just email me and we can start with a short chat to see if we're a good fit. You can always get me at rocky at richersoul.com. I'd love to hear how you're doing and how the information I've shared has helped you. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.